Well, good morning or afternoon or evening. Welcome to the scripture habit. Welcome to this community, this resource, this space. Our goal is to help you develop the habit of getting into scripture every day. It's a life transforming habit, but <clears throat> we know sometimes scripture can be intimidating. And so we show up, we say, hey, we'll meet with you. We'll talk about it together. We don't claim to have all the answers, but um, we'll discuss the word, yeah? My name is Rebecca, by the way, I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here at The Scripture Habit, and I say, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are uh, jumping in now <clears throat> to John chapter eight. Technically, we're gonna pick up the last verse from seven uh, and go through verse 11 in John eight today. It is a scene, a moment that you most likely recognize, the story of an adulterous woman being forgiven. We're gonna discuss it together. And specifically that statement that Jesus makes, go and sin no more, right? I'm sorry, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. That's it. He also says go and sin no more at the end. But the one that we're gonna discuss in greater uh, depth is the let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Because I think a lot of people, and including myself, I have misused it. Yeah. So we're going to wait just a second for friends to join us in the live. Like Gloria, good morning, Gloria. Good morning. Hopefully the signal is good. Let me know that everything is okay. All right. <clears throat> it is, it's Tuesday. Yeah. My daughter's made me hot chocolate hot cocoa this morning, which I thought was so sweet. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, let's pray. And then we're going to go ahead and dig in. Yeah. God, thank you for being with us. Jesus, thank you that you are the word. You are the word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. Let us, let us lean into scripture, not just to know letters on a page, but let us lean into your heart, God. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that feedback, Gloria. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> We're going to start. Uh, let, let's, let's look at John. I'm going to point out to you something that I think always gives a question. The section that we're going to look at, it actually starts in the very last verse of John 7, verse 53, and then it'll go through verse 11. Most, um, most conservative scholars, or if you have a Bible that is translated more recently and printed, a lot of times they have an asterisk about this section, all right? Let me show you. Oh yeah, here we go. That's our title of this study. Okay, here we go. The earliest manuscripts do not include this section. Does your Bible have that? <clears throat> Does your Bible say earliest manuscripts do not include the following section. And I don't know about you, but then it makes me wonder, well, then why is it there now, right? You have that question? Listen, just so that there's no confusion, um, scholars, like, they agree that this definitely belongs in the New Testament without question. The, the question that comes up is where does this go? Where in the Gospels? Be, because some of the earliest manuscripts have included this, but they put it in different places. Good morning, Melanie. Good morning. <clears throat> Here's what I mean. Um, here we go. So one group of manuscripts inserts the section after Luke 21, 38. So they have this in another gospel, some of the, the earliest ones. Uh, a few manuscripts have this section in John, but later, at uh, after verse 24 of chapter 21, one has it in John 7, 36. Um, I think another 7, 7, 44. Listen, so the question is not, is this um, valid or authoritative acceptable to be included. That's not the question by any scholars. The, the question is, where did it best belong? Yep. Yeah. Um, good morning, Judy. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm, I, I thought it was worth us talking about because sometimes we'll see this and then we're like, well, wait a minute. 
is that saying that there's something in the Bible that's not um, verified or whatever? Yeah, that, that's the question is just where does it go? So that's all I'm going to say about that. I want us to move on and I want us to talk about this moment. So the first thing that we need to see is actually the last verse of chapter 7. Uh, oh, actually, you know what? I loved the quote here uh, from David Gusick with Enduring Words. So let me just read that. Let me stick to my slides. All this evidence about where it is in other uh, early manuscripts, all this evidence suggests that scribes were often ignorant of its exact position, though anxious to retain it as part of the four gospels. That was from a scholar named Tasker. David Gusick's words were, they knew it belonged, but they just didn't, they didn't know exactly where. Yeah, that's all. Okay. John 7, 53, the very last verse of chapter 7, uh, says this, Then each one went to his own house. Who are they talking about there? They're talking about the religious leaders that had just had this conversation with Jesus that we broke down into multiple sections in John 7. It was during the Festival of Shelters, right? Um, John 8, 1 says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, which is like this ridge, this eastern, uh, eastern to Jerusalem, this kind of ridge. <clears throat> Good morning, Darlene. I like that they include verse 53 because it's showing that there's still this tension that definitely comes into play in the next scene. The fact that the religious leaders were upset, they had sent, remember their temple, their temple soldiers, their temple guards, stewards, uh, officers, to try to get Jesus and bring him back. And then these guys heard Jesus speak and they're like, we, we have never heard any man like this, right? And the scholar, the uh, scribes and Pharisees, the Sadducees, they get upset. And then even Nicodemus is like, well, our law says <laughs> that the uh, um, accused is, is given a, he's, has a right to be able to defend himself, right? And then they brush off Nicodemus too. So they're saying, then each one, meaning those religious people, went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And the, the only thing I'll say about that that I think is beautiful, um, everyone else went to their home, but Jesus didn't. Some, some emphasize like the comfort and you know status or whatever of of some versus jesus who um lived a very nomadic ministry evangelist life right uh the image that i love though is that it was very common for people to at times just sleep outside especially if they were traveling you know they just find a tree and sleep under a tree or something like that and so when i see that now uh this verse john 8 1 that's kind of the image that i get in my mind but look what happens next so this is basically like scene ends right but the very next day verse 2 <clears throat> um at dawn he went to the temple again so he did stay there at the mount of olives overnight uh, at dawn he went back to the temple and all the people were coming to him, he sat down and began to teach them. Notice that this was the very next day, even after all of that conflict that had happened at the temple the day before, right? It doesn't say that Jesus went off and then went and hid and didn't come back. He was back the very next day and he was teaching. And uh, I imagine the, the crowd forming around him at the temple court, right? Verse three is where there's a beat change. Then the scribes, um, some people will say the like keepers of the law, but it's the same thing, the scribes. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him. This woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. Think for a minute what they're saying. Caught in the act of adultery. Verse 5. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? And then the author, 
of this account writes that they asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. This is an interesting moment. And I don't know, the first question I think is like, well, what do they mean by trap? <laughs> what was the trap, you know? Why? Uh, and so it comes down almost, you, you think at first it's just two issues at stake. There's actually another we'll talk about in a second. The first one is um, they declare in front of everyone that, well, the law of Moses commands us to stone this woman, right? Are you going to say to do that, Jesus? I don't believe that this was a sincere question in any way. In fact, the writer tells us it isn't. They want to trap him, right? And I think that's worth recognizing. And remember, they had just had the situation with him yesterday or the day before of this moment. And it was so full of frustration on these religious leaders' side, right? Um, we could see that their anger is being fueled. So here in this moment, this, this, this thing is coming up and they're saying, okay, are you going to say yes, if the law says stoner, then stoner? If so, that's capital punishment. And guess what? They weren't allowed to enforce it then. Very rarely would the Romans who were occupying the area allow the Jews to do such a thing. Usually they wouldn't. They, they would say, you, you can manage your own stuff, but you can't kill anybody. So they're setting Jesus up. <clears throat> is he going to say yes, then kill her, in which case he is going against the Romans, potentially, right? Political tension, they can, they can then go to the Romans about that, right? Or is Jesus going to say in front of this whole crowd that he doesn't care what the law of Moses says to not do it? Right? But there's more to this moment. And, and I think knowing, understanding what's actually happening here, the significance of it, helps us understand Jesus' words, I think, so much more. And that's why they're asking, by whose authority are you going to do what? Whatever your position is, you're going to take a position that um, assert some type of authority, no matter how you answer our question. But the entire thing was a setup. The entire moment was a setup. It was a setup to get Jesus. They wanted to trap him, right? And here are a few of the ways why we can see that. First of all, we see she was caught in the act. In order to uh, to do capital punishment, they they would have to be caught in this act. And and listen, when they say caught in the act, they don't they don't mean um, they saw a woman go off with a man, right? A lot of times, uh, you and I um, <clears throat> might take a lens or an understanding of culture. We might take our limited understanding of like Middle Eastern culture, where like a woman isn't allowed to stand with a man alone kind of stuff. That's not actually what, what this was. For capital punishment, the requirement of evidence was so great. She had to be caught in the act, in the actual act. Couldn't be uh, surmised based on certain situations. There, there could be no doubt whatsoever. But the other side, another moment to it, like if you're like me, the question is, all right, what about the guy? Because look, this is what the law actually says about a situation like this. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Both of them. But we don't see the man being brought here, which, which gives us question like something isn't right something isn't right why would they just bring this woman and not the man that was just as guilty right and this wasn't like some trap or baited thing where they like baited her to it but then the guy like turned on no like they ha she had to be in the act of adultery which she was but the man's nowhere so are they really enforcing God's law appropriately? No. No, they aren't. And they misquoted it in front of the whole crowd. Women like this, you know. I, I wonder, we could probably like, 
hypothesize why the attitude was presented that way. We don't know for certain, but we know something, something's not right, right? They even say the law of Moses says, but he, here's the other part of the law, right? For this type of capital punishment, which is what they're coming to Jesus about, saying that she should be that she should be put to death, she should be stoned, right? If they're actually quoting the law, one, we know they've already they've already messed it up, right? Because they don't have the man; it's just a woman. But but the other thing is, two witnesses are required for a capital offense. That's what the Jewish law says: not one eyewitness, but you need two eyewitnesses which again makes me think set up because if someone is going to commit adultery and it's going to be done in such a way that there are two eyewitnesses that are just able to give account in that moment do you see what i'm saying like mm, something stinks something's not right right And then the last thing that lets us know again, this is a setup, is the fact that they made this big, huge scene. They interrupted Jesus teaching at the temple, which they probably enjoyed every minute of that, right? Usually it's it's very disrespectful to interrupt a rabbi teaching, right? Like there's there's a, a culture around the experience of being taught by a rabbi, the teacher, right? Um, they interrupt him and then they parade this woman and then they make their claim loud for everyone to hear. And, and you just think, man, they think they've got him. (laughs) They do. They think they've got him set up because no matter what answer he gives, it can be used against him. All the while I picture this woman who was a pawn in their game. A woman who did commit adultery. Mm. Let's keep going. I wrote infant instead of in front. My apology. Typo. Okay, here's what we see what Jesus does. Jesus stooped down and he started writing on the ground with his finger. And I've heard... I've heard a lot of uh, pastors and teachers be like, oh, what did he write? You know, and think, oh, well, what if he wrote this? What if he was writing, you know, to the woman, like, I got this. (laughs) Or what if he was writing to to the Pharisees, like, not saying it aloud, but writing them some type of message where they need to recuse themselves. I... We have no idea. We, we have no idea at all. But what we do see, what we do know, is Jesus' posture, which goes down to her level, and refuses to engage with these religious accusers who are trying to push him, to bait him, to trap him. He stooped down to her level. Yeah. And then he says this phrase, Verse 7 says, when they persisted in questioning him. So they kept wanting to push for the answer. They're like, well, we got you. You have to answer us in front of everybody, right? So they persisted. And he stood up and he said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. I think I have it on the next slide by itself. Let's see. Okay. The thing about this, I think Christians misquote this a lot, right? We'll say, he who's without sin cast the first stone. Almost to be like, you can't judge me, right? We see this verse quoted. We also see, um, you know, take the take the plank out of your your own eye before you get the splinter out of your brother's eye, right? Those are often used as a, you, you have no right to call me out on sin. You have no right to judge me. Let, let he who's without sin cast the first stone. But that's not actually the message that Jesus teaches, right? Jesus teaches us to identify and recognize sin, right? 
and and in the New Testament, even even though it it talks about um, you know not causing animosity or whatever, but especially in the New Church, right, the New Testament Church, they were to call out um, sexual immorality. You know, Paul. I think of one church that Paul was writing to, where there was a guy that was like sleeping with his stepmom or or something like that, like his brother's wife or stepmom or something. It was it was funky, right? And Paul's not gonna say, "Oh, well, I can't." You know, I'm not without sin, so I can't cast the first stone. No, no, guys, come on, common sense, common sense. We acknowledge sin for the reality of what it is. Now listen, we don't tout ourselves as better than someone else, right? Scripture tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, of God's perfect standard, right? But that's not what Jesus was saying. And I need us to get it. Here's what he was saying. In Deuteronomy, Again, we're going back to the law, right? Why? Because they dared to say that the law was on their side to stone this woman, right? We're seeing their their disjointedness or discrepancy where, where they're not actually lining up with the law. According to the law in Deuteronomy 17, 7, witnesses were required to cast the first stone. The witnesses. You know, the one that in the court of law insisted that they were eyewitnesses to this matter. They were the ones that were supposed to write the first, that uh, throw the first stone. That is the law. But then Jesus, Jesus's response. Okay, so he recognizes, he recognizes that this is a power play that this is a political thing to trap him. Um, his first response is to not engage and to just get down on the woman's level. And then he turns to them and he says, all right, the one that gets to cast a stone first, the witness, is he without sin? Right, this whole thing that's been set up as a sham, can you tell me that you have no ownership or guilt or shame about any of what just went down if you're without sin okay cast the first stone do you see that jesus was calling out the the and i don't want to say false because we're led to believe that she did commit adultery right but the whole thing was set up as a trap for jesus and she was just a pawn in the matter, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I see your, your comment, Amanda. Just talk to this, talked about this to a friend. Always believed that he was in the dirt with her on her level. I like that. Yeah. Hi, Darlene, Amanda, Karen, Rita. Hi, guys. Okay, look at this. I loved this quote from Gusick. So, in other words, what Jesus was saying by this statement the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. He was saying the one without sin in this situation, meaning I know you're guilty. I know you have set this up and her blood would be on your hands. If you're without sin in this, you cast the first stone. Isn't that a much a much clearer statement, right? That makes so much more sense because guys, we're not, we're not called to say we can't call other people out on sin, that we can't acknowledge sin in other people's lives. That is never a thing. So don't, don't let anyone use this wrong. This was Jesus calling out the religious people, right? And if we remember in the chapter before, Jesus had also called them out saying, why? Okay, if you're a keeper of the law, then why are you trying to kill me? Right? 
Again, he's calling them out because they proclaim to be so religious and to be this entrusted keeper of the law that they have studied and they know, like they've religiously puffed up and elevated themselves, and yet they're willing to compromise it for their own agenda. So how much does the the law really mean to you? You don't mind getting dirty if it helps your agenda. You don't mind breaking the law in the darkness when when you think people don't see. Mm. One without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then, verse 9, when they heard this, they left one by one. And this translation says, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center. Can you imagine in this moment, there's a crowd. I mean, picture, I mean, maybe like 100 people, 200 people that are in this temple court, right? And, and these guys that thought they had Jesus trapped, they were ready to make a big scene. And Jesus is saying, <clears throat> all right, are you going to step away? Or are we going to bring your sin into the light too? Mm. So they start backing away one by one. And so that's when, verse 10, when Jesus stood up and he said to her, Women, where are they? Women, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Why? Because the witnesses have to lead that charge, right? The the witnesses, two of them, not just one, but two, and they would have to be eyewitnesses and they would have to be the one that would throw the first stone. And so now these people that, that made these claims against her, they realize that they are guilty themselves and they walk away. So the witnesses are no longer there. That's what Jesus is saying. Those witnesses that came against you, that set you up, they're gone, right? Has no one condemned you, he says. And she looks around and she sees no one. When I, when I read that, I mean, we just see three words for her. Um, sorry, it just, it just hits me. I wonder what she felt in that moment. Realize, you know, because a lot of times there's so much when you do sin, when someone makes um, a selfish or fear-motivated decision, right? And, and it could lead people into, um, into a space where they get caught, right? I wonder, while all this is playing out, what things were rolling through her mind. Because if it were me, I can imagine um, all of the shame, all of the guilt, thinking I'm stupid and I've ruined it and I've done all of these things, right? And then suddenly this conversation has happened, right? Was she fully aware of it or not? We don't know. But suddenly she opens her eyes and looks around and they're gone. Jesus' response to her is, I don't condemn you either. Neither do I condemn you. And then he says, go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. Jesus says, I don't condemn you. And and I think that that's a beautiful word to hold to. The heart of God is not to take someone who has sinned and fallen short and like rub their nose in it, right? Humans do that. Humans do that. God's heart isn't that. But his heart is that you would see sin for what it is. That you would have that awareness to the depth of our selfishness, our foolishness and pride. Following sin leads us to destructive spaces that hurt us and everyone around us, right? And then we'd see Jesus. Jesus, who doesn't condemn us, but calls us to live a life where we don't continue in that same pattern anymore. 
And everyone else in her neighborhood, in her community, might always remember that day. They'd, they'd size her up by that one moment. It happens. But Jesus' words, I don't condemn you. And you can go live a life and not do that anymore. Not be defined by that anymore. It's beautiful. Isn't this a good moment? Yeah. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you see the heart of man, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thank you, Lord, that you do not come to um, rub our nose in our mistakes, to, you know, you don't use shame as a tactic or a tool to speak to our heart. God, thank you for that. But you do acknowledge our sin. And we acknowledge our sin before you. And then you call us to live differently. You give us the ability to move beyond the sin of our past. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. That's it for today. <clears throat> do me a favor, guys. Can you hit the share button? I think especially... Uh, processing that phrase, let he who is without sin cast the first sin. I think that that's a good thing for us to process today, don't you? Did that hit anyone else the way it hit me? Yeah? Put it in the comments. Let me know. All right, guys. Love you. I'll see you. Uh, tomorrow, I won't be here in the normal live time because it's Wednesday and we do a service in the community. Um, but I will definitely be back Thursday morning at our normal time. All right. Have a great day.